You know, one of the privileges that I have of being here, being founding pastor and long time, I can invite my friends and uh, introduce you to people who have influenced me. And I got a lot of good friends, and today I am so excited. I, I, uh, I try not to overhype what we were gonna do today, but I did maybe just a little bit, just saying this could be the most important message of the year, and I really believe that. I, I believe that it is. Uh, Miles McPherson um, is uh, several titles, uh, former NFL football player for a form. Okay, okay. You love football. That's good. I love that for you. It's great. Um, former football player for a former NFL team. Uh, he played for the San Diego Chargers, which don't exist anymore. Yeah, they're in Los Angeles now. And uh, so Miles was, was a player there. He also uh, is a pastor of the Rock Church, started it in 2000, church about 20,000 people in San Diego. And uh, he is a father, uh, he is an author, uh, but most importantly, uh, yeah, he's my friend. And uh, we, we, we've had, he's, he's a part of the ARC lead team. Uh, those of you who are familiar, we have a church planning uh, organization called the ARC, and we've, we're, we're, this fall, we will have planted our 800th life-giving church in uh, communities. In just a couple of weeks, I think we're planting 30-some churches in one weekend, and uh, we'll let you know about that and where they're gonna be. But Miles serves with me on that board, and, um, and we've become good friends. Now, how of you know that there are some friends that, that challenge you to be better? Anybody have a friend like that that just challenges you to be better? And Miles is one of those, and we've had some fun conversations uh, over the last few years, and also some uncomfortable Conversation. They were uncomfortable for me because I was awkward in them. He loves this kind of stuff. And I asked him, he, he, was, he told me he's going to write a book. And here's what I think. His book, the third option, get one of these, okay, after service. They're not even out yet. Get, get, I believe this will be a textbook for racial reconciliation in America and how it ought to be done. I really do. Our country is so divided, so divided right now. Uh, racially. I talk about football. Next week is NFL, and um, the, our church, our country will be divided about who kneels down for the national anthem and who doesn't and why, all of these, and we just have all kinds of things going on. And I believe that Miles has a message that is seminal and is, is crucial. And I told him, I said, when you write the book, uh, I want to be, I, I be the first church that you come to. So he hadn't even been to his church with the book yet. In fact, it's not out until September 11th, but we got the publisher to get us about 500 of them. So get one of these at the end of the service. And I want you to listen up. I want you to be uncomfortable a little bit. And then I want to allow Jesus to comfort you. How does that, is that you know, sometimes I say to you guys that my job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So we're gonna do the second part of that for a few minutes and then we'll do the first part. Is that, is that okay, everybody all right with that? Right, would you welcome, stand and welcome my friend Miles McPherson as he comes. <laughs> don't hurt me, don't hurt me. <laughs> come on now, give Pastor Greg a hand, come on. You may be seated. I tell Greg I have a man crush on him because I love hugging him because he's so cuddly. So cuddly. It's just like my muffin right there, right there. <laughs> and I saw him last night. I said, you lost weight, man. You're losing my, 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 my grip. I can't lose my grip. So thank you very much for um, uh, being courageous and having me and having this conversation because he called us together a few months ago and said, let's have a hard conversation. And so I want to give you, you a round of applause for just being courageous and having this conversation. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm from New York, so this is like my second time in South Carolina. And uh, I, I'm, I'm getting accustomed to your accent, because I know I have an accent, right? I, I'm from New York. I live in San Diego now, because in 1982, I was drafted to the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, I got cut, which means I got fired, which means I didn't get paid. Uh, uh, unlike other major sports, football uh, is starting to get guaranteed contracts, partially guaranteed. But when I played, nobody got a guaranteed contract. You got fired, cut, um, uh, you didn't get paid. Yesterday, every team 
cut about 35 guys. They lost their jobs, and they will not get paid. And that happened yesterday. That was a cut day. I have a younger brother who was also in the NFL. He was a Heisman runner-up in 1987. I have a, uh, another brother who was the eighth-ranked boxer in the world at one time. And then I have two sisters. They didn't do anything. Uh, they... <laughs> They were really wonderful people. They just weren't athletes. Um, so I got drafted and went to the NFL and started, got saved in 1984. I was doing cocaine every day, uh, regularly, I should say, smoking weed every day. Got saved um, in 1984, stopped doing cocaine in one day, stopped smoking marijuana in one day. Got back at my girlfriend, who's now my wife, 34 years, the same day. Amen. Come on now. Hey. Started the church in the year 2000, um, 18 years ago. We have five campuses and uh, 18 micro campuses around San Diego in the prisons and all that kind of stuff. And loving what God is doing, very um, honored to write this book. And I want to say hello to all the campuses out there. I know that we don't have books there, but I want you to go to Amazon and get this book. Uh, we didn't write this book to sell books. We want to change the country. Um, I believe the devil is overplaying his hand and people are getting tired of being divided. And so I, I believe that God's going to use this message to unite us, but we have to be willing to be united. And so my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would prepare your heart for what he's going to say to you. You are only responsible for you. And you are responsible for you. When you stand before God, when I stand before God, he's going to ask me what I did with me. Then he's going to ask me what I do with his church, but he's going to ask me what I do with me. So for the next few minutes, I pray you allow God to do something for you. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. Uh, there is a Japanese art form called kitsugi. Kitsugi is an art form where they take broken pottery and they glue it back together with gold. And they believe that the repaired uh, pottery is more valuable than the original. The devil has done an amazing job and is doing an amazing job to divide us by racism. God made us to be together. God made us for relationship in his image. And the devil has done an amazing job. The devil is very smart. Believe that. You may say, well, he's dumb, he's going to hell. Yeah, but before he gets there, he's taking a whole lot of us with him. He is extremely smart and he has convinced us that some people should avoid other people. And that some people are better or worse than other people. But there is a God who has a knack for bringing things together. And when he brings things together, somehow they are so much more beautiful than, they, than the original. I don't know if that's really true. But when he brings people who are formally separated to be united and loving each other, there's something amazing about that. Can I get an amen? I want to talk today about how, God, how the devil divided us and how we are divided. But more importantly... How God can bring us together. I'm going to give you six things for them in your notes, two or not, because we got them late. And so God just spoke later, so that means it's really fresh. Amen. It doesn't mean we're unorganized. It means it's really fresh. The guy, look at the deposit. And so I want you to get ready and I want you to prepare your heart. So let's go to the screen. This is, I, I'm, I'm working this touch screen uh, kind of new. Bam. Okay. Bam. There we go. Oh, that's me. Okay, there's my handles. Get on Instagram. By the way, on Instagram, we are telling stories and getting comp uh, information out, encouraging people in, in reconciliation so you can subscribe to that and also get the book. Let me do that again. September 15th, you're having the simulcast. Uh, hopefully you guys know about the simulcast. It's in two weeks. And it's a two-hour event on a Saturday morning. We're going to talk about the book and get people in groups to, so you can talk and have conversation. We're going to teach you how to do that. Okay. Bam. Okay. Three kinds of racism. Let's do a little very high level. Institutional racism. There are systems and rules and guidelines, governmental and undergovernmental uh, systems that separate people. My sister was going to buy a house in Maryland. And when she got a real estate agent, the real estate, she said, I want to buy a house for my family. I got two, two kids, my husband. And the real estate agent said, we have to find an appropriate neighborhood for you. She says, what does that mean? Well, she eventually divulged that there are certain neighborhoods we don't sell to black people and that we don't, we guide you away from. And she said, well, I want to go to see those neighborhoods. And they ended up moving into one of those neighborhoods. And because her husband is a police officer and brought his cop car home, when they moved in, they had nine cop cars move their furniture out of the truck. And all of a sudden, they were very, very good neighbors and everybody loved them and they had a great time. There was a system of separating people. The people in the neighborhood weren't aware of it, and the people in the neighborhood didn't care when my sister got there. They loved her, but there was a system. There's also internalized racism where people um, start to internalize the negative message they hear from other people. There are people who have been hearing all their life from generation to generation to generation that they're less than, and they start to believe it because that's all they experience. 
It's like having a fish tank. You have a fish tank with a piece of glass in the middle and there's fish on one side of the fish tank, but no fish on the other side. And the fish keep hitting, hitting the glass. They can't see it. They just keep hitting it and believe it's, they can't go past that point. The, the owner of the fish tank removed the glass and the fish never went past that point. They just believe we don't belong over there. Internalized racism, this is very destructive where people just believe what they've been told. And they live it out. Personally mediated racism, which we're going to talk more about today, is how one person expresses discrimination against another person. If there is anything you learn today, this is worth the price of admission, what I'm getting ready to tell you. Please listen to this, and I pray the Holy Spirit allow you to receive this one lesson. You can be racially offensive and not be a racist. I will tell you every human I know is racially offensive, including myself, at least racially offensive. Some are racist. Some people will say they're racist. But we're all racially offensive and not necessarily a racist. In other words, you can be racially offensive and it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the person receiving what you say or do. Or you can do it out of ignorance. It doesn't matter. The re if it happens, we have to deal with it. And so my encouragement to you is to accept that maybe I am racially offensive and I don't even know it. I want to know. We owe God better. We de God deserves more from us. Can I get amen? So if you can accept one thing, if you can get past that hurdle where you could say, listen, I want to be better. I want to learn how maybe I am offending my brothers and sisters. Then you can learn. I have talked to thousands of people in my life who can't get past that point. They'll say, I didn't offend you because I'm not a racist. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. You can be a racist, absolutely. But you, most people, I believe, are biased. And they don't even know it. They have blind spots. We're going to talk about it in a minute. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you how you could be more honoring, which is what we're going to talk about. Uh, my grandmother, uh, I have uh, uh, one, both, all my grandparents grew up in Jamaica, West Indies. I have one grandmother who was white, one grandmother who was um, Chinese and black. Her father was from China. He came to Jamaica and got jungle fever. Does anybody not know what jungle fever is? <laughs> <laughs> jungle fever is when someone who is not black likes black people, so they get jungle fever. It's an it's a urban colloquialism, whatever, but you, you, now you know something you didn't know. And this Chinese man from China, Mr. Wong, had babies from all these black women, and one of those women was my grandma. My white grandmother was sent out of Jamaica, West Indies, to Jamaica, Queens, New York, because the parents did not want her to marry a black Jamaican. So why did they send her to another Jamaica? Anyway, they sent her to Jamaica, Queens, and in Jamaica, Queens, she met a black Jamaican from Jamaica who went to Jamaica, Queens. <laughs> she started dating uh, that man, and, they started, and when he came to her house, he had to go to the back door. He couldn't go in the front door. She ended up marrying him. When she married him, they cut her off. They lived 15 minutes from us, and I never knew that they existed. They cut her off. So I'm in my house, all of us brown people, all of us grandkids, great grandkids, and one white lady. We're like, where did grandma come from? Nobody, we didn't know. We never knew. <laughs> she was just grandma. I grew up in a black neighborhood a mile from my house. I went to a Catholic school for eight years. It was a white neighborhood, all white. You could not live there if you were black. I got called names in the white neighborhood because I wasn't white enough. I got called names in a black neighborhood because it wasn't black enough. I got it from both. Amen. You know what I'm saying? It's the football girl. Amen. Amen. Come on now. <laughs> I got it, got it from both sides. But I knew people in both neighborhoods who were wonderful people, who talked about each other and said things about each other that was not true because they did not know each other. I had guys on my football team, one kid on my football team, whose parents died before he was well, I met him at 10. They were already dead. He had no parents. He was raised by his brother. How? He had no start. He had no chance to make it. These were my brothers. So I was in both worlds experiencing this. So I want to talk today about how the devil has divided us and more importantly, how we can come together. Stuff you could do today. Not only get the book, but stuff you could do today before you even leave this room. Okay, let me, let me see if I can do this. Bam. One more. Joshua. Turn to Joshua chapter 5 real quick. In every race conversation, it is about us versus them. Everyone say us. And he's trying to turn to Joshua. Joshua is the uh, fifth book of the Bible. Us versus them. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua is leading the Israelites into the promised land. And as he's leading the Israelites into the promised land, he's going to be confronted by the commander of the Lord's army. Now, remember, Joshua has the Israelites. They are going to 
take possession of the promise God has given them, the promised land. And they're going to fight the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Uptites, and Adesites. And as he's leading the Israelites into the promised land, he's confronted by the commander of the Lord's army. Dude about my height, my build, my complexion, had a sword. And commander of the Lord's army. And he's standing there and Joshua says, are you for us, are you on our side, or are you on their side? If you watch television, you listen to talk radio, our culture is telling you, you have to choose. You either have to be for them or you have to be for them. Whether it's political, whether it's racial, whether it's the police, against the police, you have to choose one or the other. Those are the two options the devil gives you. There's a third, which is what I'm going to tell you about. So Joshua says the same thing to the angel. He says, angel, you got to be either on our side or those, that side because those are the only two sides. And the angel's going to say something there's a third option. Matter of fact, the angel got his message from my book. He read my book and he got this from the <laughs> Joshua 5.13. It says, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us? Everyone say us. Or adversaries. Say adversaries. Um, I'm going to talk later about, I'm going to talk later about, I'm going to talk later about the name or label you put on those people. Are you for us? Those people are adversaries. And the commander of the Lord's army says, no. Joshua said, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. That's, that's in the Hebrew. That's Hebrew. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> it's an ancient Hebrew dialect. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. He says, are you for us, our adversary? Do you want hamburger or hot dog? No. That's not an answer. He says, no, but as command of the Lord's army, I have now come. He says, Joshua, I'm not for neither one of you. I'm not for you, and I'm not for them. Joshua says, we're God's chosen people. Yes, that's right. Joshua, this is my plan. Unity is my idea. It's not your idea. It's my idea. You bow down to me, and then we'll get it done. I'm not here to defend you. You are here to serve me. Look what it says. He says, as commander of the Lord's army, I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, worshiped, and said, what does my Lord say to his servant? What do you want me to do? And the commander of the Lord's army said, take your sandal off your foot, for where you stand is holy ground. He said, Joshua, the angel said to Joshua, Joshua, if you bow down to me, then we can get this done. The world says you have to pick one side against the other. I'm going to tell you there's a third option, and that's that we honor what we have in common, which is the image of God in which we were made. Every single person on this planet, every single human on this planet was made in the image of God with the ability to honor and worship God, with the ability to have relationship with God, with the ability to walk in relationship with God and with each other, with the ability to love and forgive and have empathy and encouragement, with the ability to speak life into each other. By the way, our image has the ability and responsibility to live up to that standard, not below it. When we live below it, when we are racist or biased or discriminatory, we live below the standard with which God gave us to live. And it has the ability and responsibility and ability to see itself in other people. The image of God in me is not inferior or superior to the image of God in anybody else. So we have, we have to honor, place a priceless value on the potential God has given us to walk in relationship with each other. Nothing lower than that is acceptable to God. And if we're in church today as believers, and by the way, the government's not going to do this. The church has to do this. This is our responsibility. God gave this to us. And if we can't do it as God's people, then God help, God can't, there's no hope. There's no hope. So let's talk about how we got divided. Social, sociologists call it, bam, in group, out group. Everyone say in group. And we'll take a deep breath in. Watch this. Say in group. Take a deep breath in. Say out group. Very good. Every single one of us are members of many groups. For example, all you ladies are a group. You're a female. All the ladies in the house say, hey. There's a group, okay. That's a group. All you who are mothers say, hey. Now, if you notice, when, when the ladies say, hey, when you say, are you a mother? Hey. 
Because <laughs> moms are tired, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Dads are a group, men are a group, single men are a group, single men whose girlfriends just broke their heart to a group, single women whose boyfriends just did some whatever is a group, uh, who got knucklehead boyfriends a group, mechanics are a group, athletes are a group, football players are a group, defensive backs as football players are a group, 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 group. Are you following what I'm saying? We all have groups. The groups you're in are your in group. The groups you're not in are your out group. So any group you're not in, female, I, I'm an out group to a female. I'm never going to be in that group. I want to be, but I'm not in that group, okay? <laughs> yeah, like, what does that mean? That means that I, girls are nice, okay? <laughs> Once you identify the groups you're in, you exhibit exercise in group bias. If you ask someone if they're racist, they'll say either no, which most people will say. Some will say yes. But the reality is the third option is true, that we're biased. We all have bias. Bias is lack of a neutral point of view. We all have been taught certain information from our family, our neighborhood, our school, the media. And the view that we have, our social narrative, the story that creates the lens through which we see the world is flawed. But we all have one. You can't not have one. And when you are in a group, you learn to be comfortable with that group. And you give preferential treatment to that group. You are more comfortable in that group. Matter of fact, here's a list of nine ways you give in-group bias. Whoops, I really messed up on that one. Damn, hey, I figured it out. <laughs> oh, this is, this is the wrong one. Give me in-group bias. I am more comfortable with those like me. Your in-group are those like you and whatever like me means. All the ladies are like me, all the moms, etc. I am more inclined to spend time socially with those like me. I am more patient with those like me. I give the benefit of the doubt quicker to those like me. I express more grace when mistakes are made by those like me. It is easier to communicate with those like me. I assume that I will get along easier with those like me. I am more willing to go out of my way to help those like me. I possess more positive assumptions about those like me. So when you walk into a room and people who are like you, whether it be they look like you or they're in your group, football players, hockey players. I was at a hotel and I met a hockey player from the NHL. If I walked into a room, there were a group of NHL guys over there and NFL guys over there. Where do you think I'm going? NFL. That's what I know. I'm going to be more patient, more kind. It's just natural. I feel more comfortable because that's what I'm used to. Say amen if this is making sense to you. It doesn't matter the reason you do this. This doesn't make you a racist. It doesn't make you a mean person. It makes you human. Next slide. The opposite of this is outgroup discrimination. I am less comfortable with those not like me. I am less inclined to spend time socially with those not like me. I'm less patient with those not like me. I give the benefit of the doubt slower to those not like me. I express less grace when mistakes are made by those not like me. It is more difficult to communicate with those not like me. I don't assume I will get along with those not like me. I am less willing to go out of my way to help those not like me. I possess less positive assumptions about those not like me. I think it's very obvious if you walk into a room and you're treating you're giving in-group bias to people who are like you, and you are giving outward discrimination to those not like you, you can call it whatever you want. But this feels like the racism I felt. Does it make you a racist? No, but this is what it feels like when people give you this, the cold shoulder. Same minute, this, if, you, if you know what I'm talking about. Same minute, this is making sense to you. Every single one of us, if you thought about this, when you're around people who are like you and not like you, you can change the way you love. You know, the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself, and we think that means, oh, I'm going to feel good about you. No, it does not. It means this. It means practically go out of your way to make sure that someone is getting in-group love when they're in your out-group. So what are six things we could do? Really simple. Number one. Acknowledge your blind spots. Someone gave me a stat the other day, and I'm going to get this wrong, but it was like 90% of whites and 80% of blacks had never had someone in their house that didn't look like them. 
A blind spot is the difference between your intent and your impact. In other words, you may intend to be nice to everybody, but the impact of what you do is different than your intent. One of the ways you can find out if you have a blind spot, an area where you may be offending people or be racially offensive and not even know it, and because you're blind to it, you can't know it, you're not accountable until you can see it. If you don't accept that you have blind spots, you won't try to give sight to something you don't know you can't see. But if you were to go up to somebody who is different than you and say, look, am I at all ever racially offensive? Is there anything I say or do? I think you might learn something about yourself and learn how to love better. Acknowledge that maybe you have a blind spot. And by the way, the blind spot means that you're blind to it. You don't even realize it. So, so th and, and, and that's why it's so hard to accept you have it because you live with it all your life. Does everybody have a blind spot? As we say uh, in New York, everybody. <laughs> you all say everybody down here in the South? <laughs> everybody. Next one, number two. Rename me as your brother or your sister. Uh, can you put up the next slide real quick? Because this, this slide is like very powerful. No more those people. Don't say that. Why? Look at the next verse. The Bible says, you shall love your neighbor, lo love your God with all your heart, with all your mind. This is the first commandment, all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor. Everyone say neighbor. As yourself. Now, what if you rename somebody other than your neighbor? You just gave yourself biblical permission to not love them because they're not your neighbor. Give me the next verse. If someone says, I love God, which I assume all of you would say, and hates his brother, discriminates his brother, knowingly gives out group discrimination to his brother, he is a liar. He says he loves God, but really he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, or sister whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This is the Bible. This is not Miles McPherson. This is the Bible. If you rename somebody, say, well, he's not my brother. He is a this or that, a white this, a black that, a Mexican this, an immigrant or whatever it is, and you put a name there that <laughs> dehumanizes them or puts them below you, all of a sudden you don't need to do this anymore. You give yourself biblical permission to mistreat them. To, to, to give them a cold shoulder or to be okay with them being mistreated by someone else because they're no longer your brother, not at your level anymore. When I used to watch the Cowboys and Indians as a kid, I used to love the uh, Cowboys and Indians shows. I wanted to know about the Indians. They rode on horses with no saddles. The ladies had long black hair like my mom. <laughs> and I want to know, but do you know what they were called? Savages. They weren't even humans. They were savages. No. They were people. They were people, just like the cowboys. But as a kid, you're told they're animals, they're savages. Put neighbor back in on their title, brother and sister. When you label somebody with something that's subhuman, I call it subhuman intentionally, when you give someone a derogatory name, you attribute to them all the attributes of that label, if they're stupid or if they're ignorant, everything you know about ignorant people is on that person, and you can no longer relate to them as an equal because you just demoted them. You can't love them like you would love your brother because you just demoted them. Rename people. See them as your brother. Look them in the eye. And see the struggle in your heart from what has been taught you. And say, no, no, I'm going to undo that. God changed my heart. Can I get an amen? Next one. Next one. Give in-group love to your out-group. Ooh, okay. Uh, one lady, one, there's a young, a young lady. She's my age, uh, which is, I mean, she's very young in San Diego. She's a white lady. She's a dear friend of mine. And we were talking about all this. And she says to me one day, you need to just get over it. And I said, hmm. I said, you know what? I think you have spent too much time surrounded by your racial in-group. 
You don't know outgroup bias. There's a, there's a guy in uh, San Diego. He's a um, leadership coach. And he wrote an article called The Right Hand of Privilege. And he basically said America was designed for right-handed people. Right hand. How many of y'all are right-handed? Raise your hand with your elbows above your ears so I can see all your arms. Okay, very good, very good. There we go, there we go. Look, uh, keep your hands up. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to make your work this morning. Okay, everyone look around the room, look around the room. Look at all the right-handed people, okay? Put your, put your hands up. How many of y'all are left-handed? I'm left-handed. Look at all the, hey, hey left-handed people. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rebellious. Yeah, that's right. We don't care. One to a hundred. The Bible says we can one to a hundred. That's right. Um, culture was made for right-handed people. You remember the desk in school? Right-handed. All you, all you right-handed people going, uh, wasn't that normal? Not for me. Us left-handers, we're right now here in space. We just got an elbow, got to kind of. <laughs> can I get amen left-handed people? Amen. It's like that was frustrating. Y'all just like, yeah, you know, whatever. How y'all doing? I'm just, just relaxing. And we're like, yeah, okay, whatever. And if you want to get a, a, a baseball mitt, all you right-handed people can go to any store you want. They got your mitts. They were designed to give you a mitt. Left-handed, they might not have my mitt. I might have to go to five stores. If you want to get golf clubs, you can go to any golf shop and get right-handed clubs. You cannot always get a left-handed club, a left-handed putter, a left-handed driver. You, have to, you might have to special order. You shake hands, right-handed people. Right-handed, shake hands. Do your oath, right-handed. Everything's right-handed, right-handed, right -handed. I'm left-handed. All of us are left-handed. So when you're right-handed, you're like, what's the problem? Go get your clubs. I can't. I got to go to five stores. You don't understand because everything's made for you. Now, does that make the right-handed people biased against left-handed people? They don't even know the advantage they have. That's called privilege. It is a privilege to walk in your in-group and always have in-group bias and you don't know any different. And you have the choice to always stay within your in-group and always have that privilege. But there are left-handed people who are always in the out-group, constantly. So I told this lady, she said this to me, I said, you, you need to experience being in your out-group, being in an out-group. So what I'm, I challenge you to do is go someplace where you're the only white person. And matter of fact, I'm going to give you some questions to fill in. I put it in the book. It's a form in the book where you, where you can actually copy and do it yourself. And I said, I want you to answer these questions. I asked six white people to do this as an experiment. I called it my walk in my shoes field trip. And I put field trip because I wanted it to be kind of, hey, this is going to be fun. <laughs> Two of them didn't buy it and didn't do it. But anyway, four, four of them did it. And she went. And, and it's like, what did you feel like when I asked you to go? What did you, what did you feel like when you were going to this place where you would be the only white person? Now, some of you may be thinking right now, well, that means I got to go to a dangerous neighborhood. Why is that the first thought? Why can't you go to a church? One of the guys who I asked said, even if I went to a black church, I would want to leave right away. I would feel uncomfortable, like everybody's looking at me. I don't know how you're going to know what everybody's thinking, but he somehow knew. And I would have to leave right away. That's sad. That's really sad. I want you to imagine, in the room I'm in, just for the record of the people watching, is mostly white. I want you to imagine if all the white people in this room were black. And all the black people or non-white people were white. And all you that are white were those few white people, that you're the minority. Would you even come? And why not? Or would you feel scared? How would you feel? In group, out group. When you are in your in group, which you are, will be for the most of your life, you will self segregate. When you see someone from your out group, your racial out group, make sure you give them, as a believer in Jesus, as an, as an expression of the love of God, make sure you give them our in group love. Make sure you don't walk in and let them be. Feel like they're in and out group. This is what diversity and the unity that God wants really looks like. When you intentionally acknowledge there is something going on and I want to be part of the problem, the, 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 the solution, and I am going to express love to that person to make sure that person does not feel like an outsider in this environment. And if I really, really want to know and learn about what this means, go someplace where you're the only white person. It doesn't have to be, it could be all black, it could be all Hispanic, it could be whatever. 
but where you are part of the out group. And then you will begin to process mentally what other people process every day. Then you will be able to understand what it means to be left-handed a little bit. And then you will come back to your neighborhood and you will sense a difference. And then you will begin to understand what you don't understand about other people. Next one. Acknowledge your brothers and sisters' color. Um, I was uh, 27, 26. These people came up to me and said, um, we don't see your color. We don't see color. And I said, oh, that's messed up. Y'all like, you never see reds, blues? Like never? You never seen colors? They said, no, 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 we, we see reds, blues, and yellows. We just don't see your color. I was like, well, how did you know I had a color that you didn't see? <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what people, oh, I don't see color. I got a black friend. You know. <laughs> the intent, the intent is to say I treat you the same then just do that. <laughs> the intent is, I have a black friend, which means I want you to think, Mr. Black Man, that I know everything about black people and I'm cool. <laughs> That's not true either. It means the brother moved next to you at no cause of your own and you had to know him. <laughs> God made this. God made what you are. I was in an in, in airport going to L.A. the first time I got drafted to the Rams, and there was a guy at the airport. He was my, um, I, I was flying airport to airport to get to L.A., and he was sitting at the gate. He was my height, my complexion, 100 pounds heavier than me. And I was like, huh, is that dude a black dude? I was trying to figure it out. And I went over to him and said, yo, man, what's your name? He said, yo, my name is Junior. He was like six foot, six one, 280, 290, straight hair. I was like, well, he ain't Hispanic. He's not Puerto Rican. Because where I'm from in New York, you, you light-skinned people are Latino or they're mixed. And he wasn't mixed and he wasn't Latino. So I'm, I was confused. I said, brother, I got to know. <laughs> where you from? What are you? He said, yo, man, I'm Samoan. <laughs> I had never met a Samoan. I, I had never met a Samoan. But you know what? I saw what he was. God made this. God made what you are. You know, when you get a tan in Hawaii, it's celebrated, right? You want everybody to see it. But when you get a tan in the womb, it's invalidated. All of a sudden, it's not important anymore. God made it all beautiful. I was watching Sanford and Son and, 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 and Fred G. Sanford. <laughs> the great philosopher, Fred G. Sanford. <laughs> He got robbed. And you know how he had the white cop and the black cop come up to his house, and, the, and the, the black cop always had to interpret for the white cop back and forth what he would say? So it, it was so great. <laughs> he talked about racial. That's your boy. Let me tell you back. <laughs> Archie Bunker, the Jeffersons. I mean, they just like, wow. <laughs> but he said, Mr. Sanford was the perpetrator colored. And he said, yeah, he was colored white. <laughs> Culture says that people are white and people of color. Those are your two choices. The third option is God just made a bunch of colors. Did you know if you go to the dictionary, white is a color? It's under W. You, you, are you guys are with me right now? If you go, W is a letter in the Bible, in, in the dictionary, right? In the alphabet. Do you know the word, the letter W? I'm not, this is not a joke. I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> Say Yes. If you go under W in the dictionary, there is a word named white. It's a color. God says, all of y'all are colored. You just color different. And, and here's, here's how cool God is. God says, I'm going to make your color where it can change. Go to Hawaii. I'll change your color. Then come back to South Carolina. I'll change it back. <laughs> <laughs> Be comfortable with what people are, and the next one is going to be so key. View every conversation as a race conversation. What I mean by that is that every time you see somebody, you acknowledge what they are. 
That's why sometimes you go to the other side of the street and sometimes you don't. That's why sometimes you say hello and sometimes you don't. And when you see someone who looks like you, you process subconsciously and then consciously what they are and your assumptions about who they are. And you have this assumption that you'll get along and have a great conversation. Why? It's in-group bias. It just happens. And then when you see people who are different, depending on what that different looks like, whether how they're dressed may, is going to impact how you engage them because you are noticing it. Why? Because God gave you a brain with 100 billion cells. He gave you eyes that can see and a brain that can think and information to process and through which to process that what you see and what you experience and what you hear. So when you see someone, be, acknowledge the fact that you automatically assume things about them, which you, happens so quick you probably can't stop it. But what you can do is, is respond and allow those assumptions to be challenged. So when you meet somebody, allow them to self-disclose. You may have your assumption, but allow them to self-disclose. Listen to their story. Ask them about their pain. Understand why they do what they do before you assume and place a judgment on them. And by the way, not only a judgment, a label on them. Here, their burden. The guy who I played football with, he had no parents. I just want you to imagine you growing up and your brother's taking care of you and your parents are dead. And you're growing, how do you go to school? How, how do you live? I never figured that out still to this day. Uh, did, he, did he get in trouble growing up? Absolutely. Did he have a heart this big? Oh, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Have a race consultation. Teach me. Talk to me. Help me understand your plight. What is it like to be who you are? Tell me about your pain. Tell me about your family. Tell me about the stories you heard growing up. And number five, and I'll end with this. Number six, I'll end with this. Give your heart to those who are not like you. Rod Carew was a baseball player, a major league baseball player, and he was a Hall of Famer. Say amen if you heard the name Rod Carew. Rod Carew was a Panamanian, and he was a little darker than me. He was a black Panamanian, and he had a 300-and-something batting average, played 18 years in the major leagues, and he had a heart condition several years ago, like four or five years ago. And he needed a heart transplant and a kidney transplant. At the same time, Conrad Rulin, a white NFL tight end from Stanford, had a brain aneurysm, went into a coma. His mother came to the hospital, started listening to his heart, and said, you are going to get out of this coma, and I'm going to hear your heart again. Conrad died. Conrad signed his organs over to be donated. His heart and kidney went to Rod Carew. Rod, amen. Rod, I'm getting, this story always gives me chills. Rod Carew, I mean, Conrad's mother calls up Rod Carew and says, Mr. Carew, you have my son's heart and kidney. He said, would you like to come listen to your son's heart? When Conrad was 11 years old, he met Rod Carew, and he came home when he was 11 years old. He said, I met to his mother, I met my hero, Rod Carew. I am going to be a pro athlete like him, and he did. She comes over, she listens to his heart. If we are so different, and we were made to be so separate, how could a white guy give his heart and kidney to a black Panamanian? The devil has duped us. We need each other. And until we are willing to put our heart into the well-being of each other, we will always be divided. But the third option says, I'm going to honor you and you and you and you. I'm going to place a priceless value on every single one of y'all as made in the image of God, as loved by God. And if we do that to each other, hmm, this world will never, ever be the same. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, there's somebody here who needs to give their heart to you. They have pain, they have fear, they're scared. Their mind is being blown right now. But Jesus loves you. He died for you, rose from the dead. If you would like to give your heart to him, just pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, take out my heart of stone. Put in a heart of flesh. Forgive me of my sin. I want to love like you. If you prayed that prayer, just slip your hand up really high so I can see you. God bless 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 you. Dozens of you all over. God bless you. Lord, thank you for those people. You can put your hands down. Thank you, God, for being good. In Jesus' name, amen.